the eager trans child, informed consent, and watchful waiting. Much anti-trans literature, some of it sadly produced in the name of feminism, features sensational stories about young children undergoing sex reassignment surgery. These surgeries are, indeed, an everyday reality, but for intersex infants and children rather than endosex children who may be trans or gender nonconforming. Let us consider an endosex child at the age of seven who expresses a very strong cross-sex identity and has done so since the age of three or four, when first old enough to articulate a sense of sex or gender. Katie was designated male at birth but has always insisted not only that she wants to transition, but that she is a girl. She has very diverse interests and isn't much concerned with conventional gender roles, but makes it very clear that whatever she's doing, she does as a girl. Further, having had time to get to know and understand this situation, her parents enthusiastically support her sense of female identity and also give positive reinforcement for her flexibility about gender roles and interests by sharing with her feminist classics like Free to Be You and Me. Coming from this positive outlook, Katie and her parents have a proposal for the professionals at the supportive gender identity center they found in their community. Why not arrange for her to have sex reassignment surgery as soon as possible, within the next year? This will resolve the body dysphoria that she experiences, as well as further solidifying her social identity. For example, at her school, where her identity as a girl is widely respected by teachers and peers, although there hasn't yet been a formal transition. Doubtless, the Gender Identity Center professionals would explain that while a formal social transition looks like a very constructive option, Surgery at this point is both unnecessary and unethical. The simple reason is that Katie, no matter how strongly or confidently she identifies and lives as female, is not yet old enough to exercise the informed consent that surgery requires. Her parents, as loving and well-intentioned as they are, cannot make this decision on her behalf. Only she can do that when old enough to fully appreciate the risks and consequences. And watchful waiting, to use the words of the WPATH standards of care, also gives Katie the time and space to test and confirm her identity and intentions during the remainder of her childhood years, with social transition as an excellent real-life experience to assist her in this process. Medical decisions can thus be keyed both to the necessities of her physical development and her maturing ability to consent in an informed way. At puberty, she will have the option of blockers to delay sex development in an undesired direction. Then, at 16, she can begin cross-sex hormone therapy, with surgery an option beginning at age 18. Although Katie and her family may find this delay in surgery a bit frustrating, we understand that it is meant to protect her autonomy and ability to make fully informed and mature decisions, giving the irreversible nature of surgery as well as its non-trivial medical risks. A professional might also reassure the eager parents that trans kids are quite capable of getting through childhood and adolescence before having surgery without any risks of lifelong gender confusion, especially when parents, teachers, and friends are supportive, as is certainly the case here. Contrast this ethical refusal to do genital surgery on a child, despite the enthusiastic desire of child and parents alike, with the routine readiness of professionals to perform intersex genital mutilation on intersex infants and children, who typically are not yet old enough to know or express their identities and wishes, based on notions of, by guess and by golly, of how the child's identity might develop. What could be a clearer indication of the small value placed on either the personal autonomy or bodily integrity of intersex people? Again, I emphasize that the scenario of Katie at age seven and her family seeking sex reassignment surgery is hypothetical and contrafactual. 
The whole point is that intersex genital mutilation needs to become equally so throughout the world. The fact that intersex genital mutilation is instead still widely practiced and can be promoted at a WPATH meeting is one cardinal measure of intersex oppression and endosex privilege.